And you might recall chastisement is not just for people who misbehave, for bad Christians. It is also for good people as well. Both good people and bad people undergo chastisement. A lot of Christians think that chastisement is for Christians when they live wrongly. So then the Lord has to correct them in the right path. However, we also learn that chastisement is for good people too. And that they do need correction and that the Lord uh, helps them through the chastising process to put them in the right path. Now, I'm not going to go through all that and explain it. Uh, at first, when you hear it, it might sound like that uh, God is actually very cruel and abusive. But no, that's not the idea. It's not the idea where if you're a good person that God wants to give you a spanking and then gets a kick out of it. Remember, that's not the case. Chastisement, remember, is a necessary process where it's done more so of healing, where it's done more so of correcting some of the points in your life where there's tension. I've constantly used the example of a piece of dung in the middle of clean water, right? I've used that as an example to show that it's not actually God's fault when there's that conflict of elements going on. Something's got to give in those elements. Something's got to suffer in those elements, right? When there's something filthy mingled with something pure. So then for the pure to stand out, it's got to suffer. It's got to keep fighting. And the blame is more so on the contradiction, not on God's, not on God, remember. So it's not God's fault. It's not like God, he's just spanking you so that he can get a kick out of it so that you can be pure. It's because there's a contradiction going on. You cannot escape that contradiction. When you're undergoing something filthy or wicked in this world and there's no escaping out of it, and we all know that, and if you want to maintain your purity, then some elements are going to have to suffer there. If the pure water wants to maintain its purity, it's got to suffer in order to keep fighting and resisting that filth from the piece of dung that's within that clean cup of water. Remember that? So understanding that, the blame is on the contradiction, the sin, the piece of dung. If wickedness wasn't there, it wouldn't undergo that. So we have to realize that's how serious sin is. Now, there are a few more nuggets and a few more good things to learn from Hebrews chapter 12. And we left off at verse 7, verse 7. The Bible says, if he endure chastening, so in other words, if you're going, if you endure, if you're able to get through that chastisement, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? It's a question that's trying to convince you that God, he's dealing with you as if you're his children. That's why he's chastising you. That's how he's dealing with you. If he doesn't chastise you, then what kind of a son are you to him? What kind of a father is he to you? Not a very good one. That's his reason. Verse 8, but if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. The author is argue, arguing if you're going to go without chastisement when all of us are supposed to partake in that, when all of us are supposed to be involved in chastisement, if you dismiss it, if you try to run away from it, then the verse says, then are ye bastards and not sons. So that word bastard, it's supposed to mean illegitimate child. In other words, then God's going to treat you like an illegitimate child. You're not his genuine child if you uh, bail out on chastisement. So that's pretty strong right there. A lot of people, they do not like chastisement, but God reasons that the chastisement is done out of love. Now, the first one is pretty obvious. When you're a bad son, then if the father just lets you alone and do whatever you want, then he doesn't truly love you. 
but the chastisement is performed and enacted upon the child who misbehaves because God loves the child. But if you're not his child, why bother correcting you? I mean, if you see some bratty kid doing whatever he wants, if that kid is not yours, you're going to let that kid do whatever he or she wants, right? But because the kid is yours, then it's going to be different. Then you want to get involved. You want to correct that child. So go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. When you sin against the Lord, we don't believe that you have a license to sin. Just because you're saved by grace through faith and not by your works, and just because no matter how many times you sin, you'll still go to heaven, doesn't give you a license to sin. Doesn't mean the Lord's not going to give you a whooping. He will give you a whooping, and you and I, uh, I could probably say, are witnesses of that. It ain't fun. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. See that? He chastens because he does it out of love. You're his child. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, the difficult part is to understand good people. How can God chastise good people out of love? Well, it's like what I mentioned to you before is that good people, if they want to retain their purity, remember that cup of water? So I'll just draw it within here. That way people can picture it and it'll become uh, more clear to them. If you want to retain your purity uh, against the filth of dung, then how are you going to maintain the purity? The elements have to fight. They have to resist each other. So as they resist each other so that this thing doesn't have a hold on you, then some element is going to have to suffer. And that's going to be the purity. The purity is going to have to suffer. And there's a contradiction of elements going on. So this process here, this cleaning process is called chastisement. This cleaning process is called chastisement. When we talk about God chastising a good child, I think that we got a wrong picture here. We're like picturing as if God ties you to an overhead beam and then he just whips the fire out of you. If you picture it like that, then you're going to picture God as an abusive per being. Remember, chastisement. So chastise, yes, it does mean whip and scourge. But let's be honest here. If you're uh, going to picture God chastising his child, you don't, it's not really a whip or literally a whip that comes out of heaven, right? It's, God's not like pulling a bullwhip out of heaven and beating your back. I don't see any of you got stripes on your back, right? So when God's saying chastisement, it's not literally in that sense. It's more of a figurative expression here that's used. The figurative expression basically is that chastisement is more of suffering here, more of cleaning here. It's to beat. There's a beating and a suffering going on. A lot of times uh, when people, uh, when they have to uh, undergo something, some sort of suffering, some sort of beating, there are things that can be cleaned out. That's just uh, genuine and natural in life. There are elements in life that has to be beaten out or that has to be suffered 
That way things can be cleansed. Chastisement is more of a process. That's the idea. It's a suffering and beating or process. If we picture it that way, then it makes more sense why the Lord does that. If the Lord doesn't do this uh, to his child, so in other words, if there's no chastisement process, if there's no beating out process, no suffering process, what's going to happen again? That thing's going to contaminate, right? So if you don't want to be contaminated, then you want to undergo chastisement. It's either or. That's why this thing is so necessary. If you get cancer, it's either you get cancer or you can go through the painful process of the treatments that they give to you, right? Whether it be natural or whether it be medical. And either way is not popular. Either way is going to hurt you. But you're not picturing doctors or certain supplements or natural treatments or medical treatments as these people trying to get a kick out of you and beating you up and laughing about it, right? See, you don't picture it that way. You don't picture these people taking out a whip and then beating you and laying down stripes on you. Are they hurting you? Sure, they're hurting you, but that hurt is necessary for healing, is it not? So you have to picture chastisement that way. It's more of like a treatment process. It's a cleansing process that does cause suffering and hurt and beating, but it is cleaning out that cancer. It is cleaning out that impurity in your life. If you don't want it, then the verse says, then the, lo the Lord sees you as a illegitimate child, not his child. If you say, God, I don't want to go through the suffering. I don't want to go through the beating. Then you, you want to remain and be infected with cancer? What kind of a father would do that to his child? Don't every parent make the tough decision, even if it breaks their heart, where the child has to go through some kind of medical treatment or any type of treatment to fight the cancer where the child's going to undergo pain. They're going to still pay for it. They're still going to make the child undergo through that, make the decision for the child to go through that. Yeah, they'll do that out of love, even if it hurts the child. Why? Because it's the best for the child, and God does it because it's the best for you. So he does so out of love because it is the best for you. But if he's going to be a horrible father, he'll just let that cancer remain in you and then kill your life. I like how that verse says right here, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So, meaning then, if you're an illegitimate child, if you want to get out of this chastisement, so let's pretend that you get away from it, okay? Let's say that you don't want to be a partaker in this. No partaking. Then what's going to happen is... The standing that you're in is not considered to be God's son then. The standing is an illegitimate child. If there's no partaking, that means you're an illegitimate child. What does that mean if you're an illegitimate child? That means you're an abandoned child. That means... The father just has a kick in doing whatever he wants and then leaves you be and doesn't want any responsibility over your life. So, do you want to be the abandoned child? You know what the problem with a lot of Christians are? I don't know if they understand this. When they're trying to run away from suffering, when they're trying to run away from God chastising or dealing with their lives, what they're doing then is that they want to become abandoned children. Now, when you're the worst place, listen, the worst place you can be more than God's chastisement, which is done out of love, 
which is done for your good and betterment, the worst place you can be is that you live a life that is abandoned by God. That's the worst place you can be. The most scary place you can be is in a place where God is not dealing with you anymore and you're left abandoned and all alone to your own whims and desires with that cancer. That's the most scary place to be. Do you want God to give you up to your desires? Do you want God to give you up to the world, the flesh, and the devil? That's a scary place to be. So it's best to go under that chastising whip, that treatment, that, ther that therapy, which is, not pretty, which is not therapeutic to you, you might think. But it is necessary because it is healing you. It is your betterment. If you don't want to go through that, then let that cancer eat you up. Let that piece of dung destroy the purity and contaminate you. Go to Romans 1. Romans 1. You want God to give you up to your desires? That's a horrible place to be at. I would, I would prefer to remain under God's care and responsibility where he can be the father taking care of me, even through chastisement. When God gives you up, look at this in Romans 1.24. Romans 1.24. Wherefore God also gave them up. All right, so there's that abandonment, right? To what? Uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own body between themselves. And then verse 26, it could even lead down to this. For, God, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And then you'll notice right here another one in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, etc., etc. Notice right here that God gives you up to vile affections, reprobate mind, and then we've seen uh, homosexuality here. We've seen a list of a horrendous sins. Why? That's that cancer. That's that piece of dung that's contaminating you. That's what happens when God gives you up. No, you don't want God to give you up. If God gives, up, gives you up, then that's fine, and that thing will eat you up and destroy your life. I, I like the last part of verse 32. Notice right here, but have pleasure in them that do them. See that dangerous wording there? Yep. The worst place God can ever do to you is let you do what you want. That's the most scary place to be is that you, you make God give up on you and let you do whatever you want. That desire, that flesh is, en is an endless pit of hell and you don't know what that thing will eat you up and make you capable of doing. It's a really scary place to be. That's why the chastisement is necessary. The chastisement is the safest place to be because it's that protection. What's it doing? It's beating that thing out of you. See, it's beating that thing out of you, that all that impurity, that corruption in the flesh. So for bad people, it's pretty easy to see. God uh, beats the child. That way the child can stay in the right path. But then for good people, that's really hard to understand. But now we understand why. It's because even good people can't run away from the impurity in this world. And as we go as we live in, the, in this impure world and there's a conflict going on, what's going to happen? It's not just going to pretend as if nothing's going to happen. When good collides with something impure, something's got to give and something's going to happen. And that's called a contradiction of elements. What Hebrews 12 called a contradiction of sinners, right? We saw at Hebrews 12. So suffering... The process of suffering is undergoing at that moment. And then when that 
process of suffering is undergoing at that moment, something's going to win. And that's either going to be good or evil. And as you're going, undergoing suffering, who's going to win, right? Is it going to be your flesh or is it going to be your faith in the Lord? So something's going to win at the end. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, and then uh, verse 9, verse 9. Now, we don't, want God, uh, we don't want God to abandon us. So if you don't want God to abandon you, then you got to stay underneath that chastising whip. You got to stay underneath there. That's the safest place to be. But if you go, if you want God to abandon you, Outside of his chastening whip, you're outside his, of his protection, see? You're outside of his protection. In verse 9, furthermore, we have had our fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Uh, the author is still trying to reason out here that, hey, in addition, we've had our physical fathers correct us and we gave them reverence and we still respected them. Well, uh, unfortunately, I don't think Hebrews 12, 9 has ap any application to today. <laughs> we lost our respect for our parents now, so uh, it's, it's, it's become a cry in shame. Yes, there's child abuse going around, don't get me wrong, but uh, remember, uh, there's always an imbalance and extreme. Now, people have taken it so far that uh, they'll contact any liberal agent to... Uh, rat on their parents, and then the parents can't do a th single thing to correct the kids. It's gotten so spoiled and messed up. We lost our respect now uh, toward our parents. It's just disgraceful. It's a crying shame. But anyway, this should be common sense, is that uh, in verse 9, we still give reverence to our parents who have corrected us. But then... Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? In other words, shouldn't we, if we can give that much respect to our physical parents, shouldn't we do the same thing in our subjection to the Father of spirits so that we can live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, so the author is arguing that the physical parents, they surely for several days, they would chasten. They would punish us. Why? Because we displease them. So we want to please our parents. If we don't please them, then we're going to be chastened. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness However, God, when he chastens us, when he spikes us, it's done for our benefit, our profit. It's not just to please him. It's not because we displeased him, that's why we're beaten. But it's also done so that for our betterment, so that we can be partakers of his holiness. So... At, in our Christian walk, we want to partake in that holiness. So that beating is necessary. That way we can grow in holiness in the Lord and partake in it. This is an exercise. We're going to see that later on in the verses there. If we look at Philippians chapter 3, we can see this fear, this respect is given. Philippians chapter uh, 3, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, chapter 2. Now, when God beats us so that we can live well for him, we have to understand that the reason why we should keep serving the Lord when he chastises us is out of fear. You should fear the Lord. I mean, we're supposed to serve him to please him. And he's a fearful God because he's a holy God. We're partakers of his holiness. But we've completely lost our fear. 
So when we undergo chastisement, we, unfortunately, we lost our fear of the Lord and we have the audacity to go up against him. That's a horrible, horrible thing. And unfortunately, most Christians react that way rather than fearing him. Now, remember in Hebrews 12, the author reasons that we respect our physical fathers and we, there's a reverence, a level of fear in there because we're supposed to please them. But, you know, that same logic is used with God the Father. We're supposed to have a reverence and fear with him. Uh, when we look at verse 12, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do, notice right here, of his good pleasure, right? That matches up with Hebrews 12, 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Uh, we look at verse 9. It says, we gave them reverence, the fathers who corrected us. You'll notice right here also, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So that gives the impression of fear, right? That gives the impression of, hey, if you want to survive, if you want to live through this, you better submit to the Father, just like we've done to our physical fathers. There's got to be a level of fear here because we want to please them. If we displease our Father and that includes Heavenly Father, physical Father, that's the reason why they discipline us. And that's why there is a level of fear. What's the good reason for it? Well, uh, verse 12 said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In verse 13, it says, for it is God. I think that's more than good enough reason. It says, because of God. Does that mean anything to you? Because it's God. No, see, that doesn't dawn in your mind. Do you know God? Do you know God? If you're going to be partakers of his holiness, do you understand holy God? Holy God is someone where you should fear. A lot of people do not fear the Lord. They have no respect of his holiness. Holy God, remember, is a person burns in hell for all eternity because even the slightest sin, because he's not 100% holy like him. We have to get that through our heads. Now, a lot of people don't comprehend holiness. Holiness is so serious to the Father that he would damn a soul in hell for all eternity. Holiness is so serious to God, yes, it doesn't matter if it's just one bite off a of fruit in the Garden of Eden. You know, what the, you know what the consequence was? Famine, disease, starvation, what you're all, all the suffering you're going through right now. That's the heavy consequence of sin. Holiness is such a fearful thing. Holiness is a fearful thing. A lot of people don't understand a holy God. Mount Sinai, if the holiness of God was so real that if you touched the bottom of the mount, God would strike you through with a dart. Holiness of God was something to be so respected and feared that if you took his name in vain, because it's a holy name, you were stoned to death. Stoned to death. Do you understand? You're not just shot to death. You are stoned to death. You've seen some of that before? That it's, pretty, it's pretty cruel, you would say. It's pretty brutal. Why? Because a lot of people don't understand how serious, how fearful holiness is. Now, if we understand that we're dealing with a holy God, then how can we, in our right minds, as we undergo chastisement, just go up against him like that? You know what will keep you in the right path as you're undergoing chastisement? A lot of us think we need comfort, we need love, but a lot of times, sometimes what will be good for you is fear. Yeah. Yeah. 
You'll need a healthy dose of fear, realizing that you're dealing with a holy God right here. I mean, if God is God, if he is who he is, who are you to tell him what to do and tell him what is better? Who are you to tell him your feelings when he created your feelings and he knows your feelings? And by the way, he's already feeling your infirmities. You don't have to tell him how you're feeling. He knows what you're feeling. You know, uh, we lost our fear of the Lord. If you're to think about back in the old days, pagans, when they were offering up children as sacrifices, which is so horrible right there. And then people who did human sacrifices and they went through all kinds of stuff. The, you don't hear much complaining going on from those pagans back then. You know why? They feared their gods more than Christians fearing their holy God. And those gods are just wood and stone and corrupt and demonic and evil. But you got a God who's pure, who's undefiled, who gave his life for you out of love, and he doesn't have to prove more of his love after that. Right. What more does he have to prove to you? What more do you have to demand out of him? I think by this time you should learn to fear him. Remember. Not that the Lord has to keep giving you answer after answer, prove himself to you over and over and over again. He proved himself too many times to you. I think about this time, you ought to put on the brakes and realize, I think I got to learn that I better shut my mouth before the Lord does something to me. You know, all the thoughts that go in your mind and all the stuff that you set out of your tongue against the Lord. Do you know how, do you know that the seraphims and cherubims would not dare even say those words to God at the throne of glory? They can only say one word. Right. Holy, 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 holy. holy. Yeah. Right. They wouldn't dare say the stuff that you would say. I wonder if the devil would dare say some dare say some of the stuff you say before the throne of glory. Fear of the Lord, right? Amen, brother. Fear of the Lord there. We lost our fear. Right. We can't, uh, what will keep you in peace, I think, is if you scared the devil out of you. Mm -hmm. If you put the fear of the Lord inside your heart, yeah. and then maybe you'll finally be content with your Christian walk when you go chastisement. Just keep your head. Yes, you're miserable, you're in pain, but you know what? It's better to just shut your mouth and keep your head low when you're going through that. Rather than... I think just shut your mouth and just... All right. Fear. We lost our fear of the Lord. For it is God. For it is God. As, uh, but the good news is when we look at Hebrews 12, the Lord's doing this so that we can please him. But it's not the verses arguing at verse 10. It's not restricted to pleasure. It's not done to please him. That's not what it's restricted to. It's more so for our profit at verse 10, our benefit. You know, when God does this, we have to understand he's doing this for our welfare. You know what that means? It's done not for his pleasure, but for ours. That's the idea. That's what our benefit is. That's what our welfare is. It's not thinking about yourself, what pleases you, but for the other. So isn't that amazing? It is true that uh, in verse 9 and 10 in Philippians chapter 2, as we undergo things in our lives, we're doing this so that we can please the Lord. But isn't it amazing that the verse argues that God is saying, well, it's more than that. It's not to please me. It's more so for you. Why? Because when you're undergoing that cancer, as you're going through that filth, it is really more for your betterment, more than God's. It's more so for your betterment, more than the Lord's. 
So that's why this uh, purification process is necessary. It's done where uh, it's for my good. It's for my betterment. It's for me. God loves his child. He does it for my sake, my welfare. How is it your welfare? Well, plenty right there. You don't get messed up. That's it. You don't get contaminated. You don't get that cancer smoke, uh, engulfing your life. Plenty of benefit right there. And think of what happens. You ever thought about this? Think of it, what happens when this is gone. So when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, and this is out of your life, what happens when you get purity? Think of all the benefits that come out of that. Have you counted the blessings that come out of that? Have you counted the blessings that come out of the victory against the trial that you had? It gave you a stronger you, right? It brought you a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. You saw blessings that the Lord has given to you spiritually and even physically through that. So in the end, it was done for your welfare, wasn't it? More than the Lord's. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 again, and then uh, we'll look at verse 11. Uh, excuse me. In verse 9, the verse says, Shall we not be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So I mentioned to you before, you want to survive, right? Because you want to survive, that's the reason why I keep your head down and then just subject yourself to the chastising whip of the Lord. Why? Because you want to live. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and Romans 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and then Romans chapter 8. Now there are two meanings here for live. One is, like I mentioned to you before, is survive. The chastisement is done so that I can live, I can survive because this piece of dung or the cancer is killing you. So you don't want to die, you want to live. So it has to do with surviving. That's what live means. But also, we'll come to the second definition later. Go to Romans chapter 8. If you're a Christian who lives in wickedness and sin, well, hey, um, you better subject to the chastising whip of God. If you don't, cha if you don't subject to it, then you're going to kill yourself one day, right? Notice right here in Romans chapter 8 and then in verse 6. For to be uh, carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace. So if you want to live, then you cannot live within a carnal life. Look at verse 13, verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So in Hebrews 12, when it says that you're going to live, that's killing off the impurities. Again, uh, let me draw that out again. That's cleaning, uh, that's cleaning out the impurities of the flesh right here that's still in you. That cancer, that piece of dung that's contaminating you. So if you want to live, then that thing's got to be chastised, beaten out. But... It's also 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 Thessalonians 3. Not just surviving, but it also means truly living it. Life is worth the living. So real living. And isn't that true after chastisement, you felt like you're really living now? It's a different you, isn't it? Life has become more living now. It's become different to you. Your perspective has changed. 
The way you retain joy and peace in the Lord is different from the immature way you've done it before. So that's what live means. Live from these two uh, definitions means to survive, where all that cancer, that uh, dung is cut out of your life, but also just really living it. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, notice in verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 3, 8, For now, Paul says, we live, if we stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. So notice right here that we live, to Paul, has to do with really living it, where life is worth the living, where it's joyous and real to him. You ever seen these people eaten up by that cancer? Do you think they're really living it? You've seen these uh, Christians who backslid, aren't living for the Lord? You think they're really living it? No, they're not. They're not really living it. So they're not really living it, let alone surviving. That kills them eventually. A lot of them die. Look at the Hollywood actors, actresses, they all die. Why? Because th they weren't really living it. And now, physically, they weren't living either. They took their own lives. That's what happens when that thing is not beaten out of your life. Do you see that? That thing's got to be beaten out of your life. That's why the chastisement is there. All right, let's go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And then verse 11. Now, I like this part in verse 11 because it's so true. Notice right here, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Yeah, amen, that is very true. Notice right here that when God chastens you at the moment, at the present, it's not happy. It's grievous. So God admits it. There's nothing to be happy about. So notice right here that God is not a uh, God is not the type that gets a kick out of beating you. He understands that there's something sorrowful. There's something grievous with this. It's not something to be joyous about. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby, meaning that even though at the present, at the moment, you're undergoing through a lot of sorrow and grief, nevertheless, after it's all said and done, not now. Do you understand that? Not now. Well, pastor, I'm not happy in the Lord. Yes, you're in the right place. All right. You're in the grievous stage. Not now. Sorry. All right. So, yes, if you're not feeling the joy of the Lord right now, you're in the right place. That's why I said I like verse 11. God admits it with you. It's a grievous stage. It's afterward when it's all said and done. Then what happens is that chastisement, it yields, it brings forth a piece of it brings forth the fruit, and that fruit is very peaceable, and it's righteous, it's holy, to those who keep exercising, who have been going in and out, in and out, habitually, habitually exercising, performing it. Let's go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And then Romans chapter 6. James chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6. Notice that uh, this matches with uh, what James talks about, the peaceable fruit in James chapter 3 and verse 18. Verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them 
that make peace. You'll notice right here that the fruit of righteousness that you can get, it has to be sown. Let's see here. Now that's what we want is this fruit of holiness. We want the fruit of holiness in our lives. It's got to be sown. When the seeds are scattered and is sown on the ground, Hebrews 12 said it yieldeth the peaceable fruit, right? So it's going to bring forth, break forth out of the ground there. That's yielding. So it has to yield. How does it yield? It's yield through, notice right there at Hebrews 12, the exercise, right? Those that are exercised thereby. Uh, let me look at Hebrews 12 again. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah. So, as you undergo that chastisement, that exercise comes in. Combine it with verse... Ah, oh, man, I don't want to do this. Okay, I'm going to go all over the place. Let me do it. All right, so let's go to verse 12 and 13, okay? Notice right here, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So you got hands that are hanging down, knees that are feeble. Why? Because of chastisement here. Chastisement, it, it hurts you. It crippled you. So what are you supposed to do these things? If you're undergoing the crippling, it's not that I need a heavier dose of medicine that all of a sudden I can move my legs and my hands. No, you're supposed to move those hands and those legs. But it's feeble. It's hurting. That's what exercise is for. In, even uh, in hospitals, it hurts and people hate it. The clients hate it. But if you want to use your hands again, if you want to walk again, you're going to have to pick, lift up those hands and those legs that are feeble and hurting and just exercise it. That's what you've got to do. That exercise, see, is the chastisement there. That's the process there. Now, how are you exercising, right? Even physical exercise. If it doesn't hurt, then you're not doing it right. Right? It's just common sense. If it doesn't hurt, then you're not doing it right. When you start out, it really hurts, right? Right? It stinking really hurts. And you're like, why does it hurt so much? Because you got all that crud in you. So that thing has to die, all right? That thing's got to die unless you want that thing to contaminate and ruin your life. And that's why you don't feel like you're really living life. And some of you won't survive eventually. You're going to die out. That's why that exercise is so important because what you're doing is now it's hurting. And when you're hurting, good. That means you're in the right place. Now, let me tell you this. If you're living your Christian life where it's not hurting, there's, you better question your Christian walk. But if it's hurting and it's really hurting, then you must be in a good place. You must be serving God at a good point in your life. You must be in the right church. You must have volunteered for the right task for the Lord. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. It hurts, but hey, you're becoming healthy. Right. It's good for you. And you've changed a lot of your perspective, haven't you? That thing has diminished a lot, hasn't it, in your life? In verse 13, uh, let's see right here. So then, as you're undergoing this exercise, what happens is then it's going to yield the seeds right here, are going to yield the fruit. And this fruit, 
James called it peace. It's a peaceable fruit. Well, I don't have peace right now, Pastor, because right now you're exercising. You're not in peace. You're in grief. Right? Hebrews 12, 11 said that uh, it's not joyous, it's grievous. So you're in the grief stage. Now, if you want the peace stage, you're, then you're going to have to keep exercising until you get that peace. Now, isn't it true after you, do, after you exercise so many times, you kind of get a peace in your body? You, get a, you got a peace even in your heart a lot of times after you've exercised so many times. In the beginning, it don't feel like peace, especially when you wake up and then you feel the muscles and you go, oh man, this don't feel like peace. Of course, you're in the grievous stage. In the Christian life, we developed a lot more peace after, not during, after the suffering, haven't we? Because we learned something. We exercise into something. It changed our perspective. It changed our behavior, our attitude, our perspectives and things in life. And that's the fruit you want. You want that peaceable fruit of holiness? Then you got to keep on exercising. Keep lifting up those feeble hands. Keep lifting up those feeble needs. And yeah, it hurts. And a lot of times you get angry at your therapist and you just want to complain and get bitter and mad at the therapist. What are you doing? Are you trying to kill me? No, I'm trying to help you. God says, I'm trying to help you walk so that you can walk, you can run. Well, I don't want it. You know, for the therapist who is not getting paid to do that for you, you want him to then abandon you. You sure got a very patient therapist up in heaven who's not getting paid for it, and he's paying you for that too. Now, we look at Romans 6, and then I want you to compare that with 2 Peter 2. Romans 6, and I want you to compare that with 2 Peter chapter 2. The opposite is true with sin. You can yield into uh, really bad uh, stuff and exercise deeper, deeper into sin. If you can do that with sin, then we are to do the opposite and do the same spiritually. Notice right here, Romans 6, 13, 6, 13. Neither yield. See that? Now we want to yield holiness, right? But the scriptures warning you, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Notice also another one. Uh, verse 22. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your what? Fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. See, the verse is arguing you want to yield where it brings forth that fruit of holiness that Hebrews 12 is talking about. But the opposite is true. You can yield where it can bring forth sin unto deeper sin. Look at verse 19, 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto what? Iniquity. iniquity. Even so now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. That's the fruit of holiness. So in other words, if we can exercise where we yield in a point of sin, uh, of uh, of uh, a fruit unto holiness, we can do the same thing of sin unto deeper sins. That yielding, so that's the point that I'm trying to draw at, is the yielding here. That yielding is very, very important. That yielding. What are you giving into? That yield is a very important thing. That's important for the filling power of your Holy Spirit. I don't know if you knew that. That's also important in victory against temptation and sin. Yielding is very powerful. 
So in other words, who are you giving into, right? Are you giving into everything that the flesh tells you to do? Then as you give in every time the flesh tells you to do something, see, you're used to that exercise. And then it makes you deeper into sin. Fruits like the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. That's the kind of fruit you're getting into. But if you yield wherever your spirit is telling you, read your Bible, pray, serve the Lord, stuff like that, then what happens is that constant exercise will also yield the fruit that is peace. Now in 2 Peter 2, look at verse 14. 2 Peter 2 Verse 14. Notice what happens with this exercise here. 2 Peter 2, 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that what? Cannot cease from sin. Did you read that? That's scary. Why? Because if you constantly yield to sin, get into that exercise, you can't stop. Look at Keep reading, beguiling unstable souls and heart. They have what? Exercise with covetous practices. So they've been practicing and they've been exercising. And then now they can't stop sinning. What happens if you don't want to go through chastisement, huh? If you don't want to go through that exercise, huh? The chastisement exercise. Let that thing contaminate you. And what's going to happen is that thing's going to grow and you can't stop. I told you, the most scary thing is that God gives you up to that and you just can't stop. You ever seen some of these people? If you think that I'm, if you don't think this is serious, check out some of those drug addicts, how they ended up there. They don't end up high on heroin or the strongest uh, dosage of drug just like that. It came from exercise. It came from one bad behavior to another one, to another one, to another one, and constant exercise. And there was no loving father that time that would put them in the right path. You ever talk to some of these people when they try to get out of heroin? It's like they have to stop breathing to them. And they feel like they can't stop. And some of them get so miserable, they commit suicide. This includes sodomites. Don't you know that? I've talked to some sodomites. They are at a point where some of those people, they just, uh, they try to get victory over their lifestyle and they're like, they just can't. It's sad. It's really, really sad. I actually hugged one. I, I hugged a sodomite. I felt so bad for that person. That person wanted to get victory. He talked about how he tried to commit suicide a few times. I felt sorry for that person. How does that happen? If God gives you up. If the, the, you have no loving father chastising you. So if you think a loving father chastising you is mean, then you try to go to the way of abandonment and see what that's like. Then you're at a point you feel like you can't stop. That's horrible. All right, go back. Makes you want to go under the whip after that, right? <laughs> Makes you want to run to the whip after that. Oh, God, beat it out on me, please. <laughs> <laughs> tonight's teaching is tonight's teaching is something else okay teaching you to fear God and all this kind of stuff I don't know where all this is coming from all right verse uh, 13 let, let me give you something positive now okay verse 13 and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way so in other words, the path that your feet is walking on, make sure it's straight. Why? Otherwise, the, the feet that's lame gets turned out of the way if the path ain't straight. If it's crooked, if it's rough, then the lame feet is going to turn on itself. It's going to uh, step on itself or get crippled more or hurt, injure itself. But let it rather be healed. Healing is done when the path is straightened. Okay, now this is... Now, this is the comforting part. As you're walking along the road, the road that you're walking along is a rough road. It is not an easy road. We are traveling to heaven, right? But just because the road is rough and uh, doesn't mean that you can't make it 
easier for your lame legs. So your, le your legs are lame. How is it supposed to walk when it's all crooked and rough and messed up? You want to straighten it. So a lot of times you have to do this. When you're exercising those hands and those legs, you have to make sure that you're walking on straight paths, not on rough paths. A lot of people, when they try to serve God, they're like, okay, let's do it. And then they lift up the hands and the feeble knees and they do it uh, to a point where they overexert themselves and kill themselves. You can make it easier for yourself. You know that? You can make it easier for yourself. Here's an easy example, okay? Church is a place where it makes things easier for you. Rather than you in a wicked neighborhood all by yourself trying to fight out the sin. So it takes effort lifting up the feeble hands and the knees. It does take effort, all right? It hurts. It's called exercise. But then you're getting to a easier place called church to help you. Now, you know what a lot of people make the mistake of doing? A lot of people make the mistake of putting themselves in difficult situations to overcome the trial while seeking to not even exercise the hands and the knees and they want their hands and knees to do nothing. Does that make any, any sense to you? In other words, we make difficult the situations that we don't have to make difficult. And then uh, we make easy of the situations that we're not supposed to make things easy. The things that God make easy for you, you should keep it easy. And the things that God make difficult for you, you should make it difficult. Why do we always make it so opposite? It's called rebellion. It's called being stubborn. It's called being fleshly. It's, because, it's called, I want to do what I want to do. Why don't we just shut up and just do it God's way? And then everything is just fine after that. He makes the path straight. He makes things easy for us, so take advantage of it. Well, if I take advantage of it, it just makes me look weak and pathetic. You are weak and pathetic. <laughs> just humble yourself, okay? If God made it easy for you, just thank the Lord for it, man. Amen. Well, coming back to church, you know, it just makes me feel so weak and pathetic. No, you are weak and pathetic. Come back to church, all right? And just undergo the preaching and then the fellowship and don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel like everyone's judging me and, oh, why, do I, why am I so messed up? And, oh, I'm just so weak. Oh, pastor's going to think of me that way again. Or pastor's preaching about me again. And will you stop and just come? Right. All right? Just come. All right? Don't just come. And who cares if... If you feel like that, oh, it's just too easy on me, or I'm going to take advantage of this. and No, no, just if God made it easy for you, make it easy. Because lame legs need to walk on something, okay, where they can walk on. But let it rather be healed. Now, that should prove that the, the whole context, listen, of verse 5 through 13 Chastisement is not done to injure or hurt you or to abuse you. That should prove to you in verse 13, chastisement is more of a healing process. So that verse is really good, verse 13. It proves that the whole process is healing. So when you think of chastisement, don't think about a God up in heaven who has a bullwhip beating your back and you're tied to overhead beam. No, think of it more as a therapist there who's on the bed with you and trying to get you to exercise it so that you can be healed. When you think of chastisement, think of it that way. That's what chastisement means. Then you'll probably picture God more differently. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Thank you so much, Lord, for the truths of your word, the comfort from your word that can help us through hard times and difficult times, and also the convictions that we need, the hard stuff we need to hear so we can be convicted. Father God, thank you for being a loving father. Lord, uh, help us to go underneath that chastising whip and realize there is no safer place to be, Lord. Lord, you're only doing this for our benefit, for our benefit, Lord, not even just to just please you, but more so to 
benefit us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.